Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. We got Benny behind the glass, and we have a very special guest. Today, we're going to do an episode on uh, the bodies that have been... Don't po- forget to subscribe. Yeah, sorry. I'm gonna, I'll get to that in one <laughs> second. Uh, we're going to do uh, uh, an episode on the bodies that are uh, popping up in Las Vegas that uh, authorities believe the at least one, if not more of them, could be tied to the uh, Tony the Ant Spilatro, uh, that bloody reign of, of uh, mob power in Vegas that uh, Tony Spilatro lorded over uh, most of the 70s into the 1980s, was all uh, put onto the big screen in the movie Casino. And uh, a lot of that's coming back to light uh, with, with the background being the fact that uh, there are bodies being found in Las Vegas now that because of precipitous water levels dipping at Lake Mead, uh, there's been over a half a dozen bodies that have come to the surface over the last year. And my reporting is telling me that one of those bodies is being identified or is the feds are zeroing in and the state authorities are zeroing in they believe that they're going to identify one of the bodies as uh, a former Chicago mob associate named Johnny Pappas, who disappeared in 1976. We're going to get into that. We're going to bring on a, a, a very special guest. First, I want to tell everybody to please like, subscribe, share our Original Gangsters podcast on YouTube. Spread the word. Pound the like button. Uh, let everyone know. We're, we're growing every day, and we're going to keep on bringing you great content, and hopefully... I keep on teasing this uh, more content. Uh, I, I think we want to get to a point where we're, we're giving out three pieces of content at w- a week at least, um, and then go from go from that point. So let's bring in our guest, uh, veteran crime reporter, and we talk about the, all the OGs uh, on the podcast. Whether we're talking about OG gangsters, OG law enforcement, but you know, from being a you know reporter myself, I I always tip my cap and give a nod to the OG crime reporters. Larry Henry, thank you for joining us. Uh, old-time Las Vegas crime reporter, political reporter. Worked at the Las Vegas Sun, worked uh, in his home uh, home state of Arkansas. Uh, today, he works for uh, gamble, uh, sorry, Casino.com uh, and, and the Mom Museum, where he writes, uh, he writes for Casino.com weekly. The Mom Museum, he's got a, a column that comes out uh, every month. And uh, Larry, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Scott, for having me. Let me say before we start, I'm a subscriber and and I agree. Please subscribe not only to the YouTube channel and the podcast, but also to the website. Nobody has better sources in uh, in, in what's going on with uh, the mob and the underworld and Scott. So thanks for having me. It's great to uh, be here. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, www.gangsterreport.com. Check it out. Shout out to Ben behind the glass, who's taken us to a whole other level with both the podcast and the website. So we couldn't do it without a without our MVP, Benny. Um, so Larry, let's you know, Jimmy and I were talking off air. The last episode we did on this was about a year ago. There's been a, a developments. So let's kind of unpack it. You know what exactly happened uh, first. So for people that might not know. And then kind of dive into what's going on right now. So I teased it that one of these bodies that's come to the surface, uh, investigators are now of the opinion that this one body, which was known as the body in the barrel, was the first body to surface uh, first week of May 2022 or last couple days of April, first couple days of May 2022. Uh, a, a rusted barrel with a body with two bullet holes in the back of the head um, comes to the surface and immediately people start thinking about Tony Spilatro and uh, his reign on top of Las Vegas underworld from 1971 till 1986. Probably three dozen gangland homicides tied to that area, tied to that era, if not more. This happened in 1976. Uh, Johnny Pappas disappeared. Larry, what were your first, what were the first thoughts that came to your head when, when these, well, the body in the barrel was the first one to pop up and then another f- five or six popped up uh, 
throughout the rest of 2022. What were you thinking when you heard about this news? Same thing as everybody else. <clears throat> when I first saw it, Scott, I thought mob. Um, I, I wrote some stories for gambling.com, uh, gambling.com where I am now and began to dig into it like, like a lot of other people did and, and still am fascinated by it. As you say, last May, a year ago, uh, some, some recreational, uh, you know, users of the lake, the lake, because of the drought in Southern Nevada, that's the water resource for 30 miles from Las Vegas. That's the water resource for the city and the whole area. Now the city is, is downtown Las Vegas is a city, but the strip is really outside of city limits, but everybody, including me, refers to that whole area as Las Vegas, except when you get into Henderson and places like that. But that lake began to recede because of the drought severely received. And as that happened, the first thing that popped up, as you said, Scott, the first week of May, a barrel a corroded 55 gallon drum. You think back to the Johnny Rosellis who, who were found in Miami in a drum. And so, so you're thinking mob. So barrels taken back, examined, turns out to be somebody who, based on the clothes, a watch, some clothes, some Kmart clothing, uh, was, was, the, the time frame attached to it was late 70s to early 80s, and the person had been shot to death. So, of course, everybody's thinking mob. Now, the image and the stereotype over time was mob takes people out in the desert. Las Vegas had always been sort of a, a, a zone where, a, a lot, as you, you know better than anybody, Scott, a lot of different families operate operated in Las Vegas throughout the years when, when the mob controlled casinos on the Strip, especially in downtown. But, um, you know, the, the image was they would take them out to the to the desert, reinforced by the movie Casino, came right. out in 19 That famous line, there were a lot of problems that were solved in that desert. Solved the desert. Joe Pesci playing the person you mentioned, uh, based on uh, the person you mentioned, Tony Splotro. So they take this body back. They discover that it, this person was killed during the era when people like Tony Spilatro, Frank Rosenthal, the Chicago outfit, all those people were extremely active. So clearly my thought was uh, like like yours and everybody else's, I think, Scott, this was a mob hit. And let, let's be clear, too, that, I mean, as crime reporters, that's um, immediately our radars are going to be fixed on on, an, on a La Cosa Nostra or a, a mob hit. But just be, it doesn't mean that everybody that's coming to the surface is a mob hit. And I know that at least one body, I think maybe two bodies have been identified as either drowning victims or boating accidents. Boating yeah. accidents. Yeah. So, but the more bodies that come up and, and two bullets in the back of the head, ain't right. a boating accident. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and if you listen to the experts, they're saying that this is not going to be something that stops happening that the, the water level is going to continue to drop over the next year to two years, and they expect to have dozens of, of more bodies. So, uh, but, but when we're talking about Spilatro, I think the most interesting part, and I don't even want to credit it as my reporting because this was a, a, a statement made by a member of law enforcement, and then I was able to kind of piggyback off of it. But in addition to what I've heard in the last couple of months that law, uh, that law enforcement in Vegas is zeroing in on ID in that body as Johnny Pappas, there was a comment made to the press somewhat recently that law enforcement believes that if it is Johnny Pappas, that they could potentially bring a case, which tells you that there are people still alive that they are tying to that murder. Um, and the name that I have come across uh, is Paulie the Indian Shiro, who was recently released from prison after doing about 22 years um, on another murder, uh, which actually happened out on the West Coast, even though Paulie was a, a Chicago outfit soldier that worked for Tony Spilatro, was very close friends with, Paul, uh, with, with Tony Spilatro. And when Spilatro got sent out to Las Vegas in 1971 and was, was told to put together a West Coast outfit crew, he uh, got Paulie, Paulie Shiro from Chicago, put him in uh, Phoenix, and that became his, uh, you know, his, his boots on the ground in Arizona. But whenever Spilatro needed wet work done, and there was quite a bit of uh, murder and bloodshed, especially in those first handful of years that he was coming in and, and, and uh, you know, establishing his, his dominance. Uh, 
he would call Pauly Shero to Vegas to help him with that work, according to sources, according to court filings and, and FBI documents I've seen, um, and, and sometimes dispatch him to California. But uh, I was told by someone that no Shiro and that knew Pappas that uh, Pauly Shiro was in Las Vegas in August of 1976 when Johnny Pappas disappeared, as well as Jay Vandermark disappeared. They both disappeared in the same uh, two to three week time period. And it was in the wake of the first federal raid of casino count rooms, which would eventually flourish into the uh, straw man, uh, Operation Straw Man cases that came in the 1980s. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. You know, Vandermark was the slot manager at the Stardust, which was the property that Frank Lefty Rosenthal illegally managed for Midwestern mobsters. And, and, and disappeared. He's suspected of skimming off the skim and also potentially turning and becoming a government informant. Now, the same with Johnny Pappas. Johnny Pappas, as you noted, Scott, Chicago Outfit Associate, tied in, tied in with uh, Alan Glick. Alan Glick was the San Diego businessman, young guy, Vietnam veteran, comes over to Las Vegas, uh, real estate guy from San Diego, gets Teamsters loans. With those loans come a commitment to, to be beholden to the mob. And Glick had four casinos in the Las Vegas Valley. He had the Hacienda, where Mandalay Bay is now. He had the marina, which has become a part of the MGM Grand out by the airport. He had the Stardust, which, which has been demolished and now is where Resorts World Las Vegas is. And he had the Fremont downtown. The Fremont's still there, by the way. FanDuel, the sports betting company, just opened a sports book in the FanDuel. I mean, I'm sorry, in the Fremont. So he also had Argent Corp was the name of his company funded by Teamsters loans. He also had Echo Bay Resort. Echo Bay Resort was a property, as you know, Scott, out on Lake Mead. About 50, the lake's about 30 miles. The, the resort was somewhat farther out, but it was a popular place. There were 50 some odd, built in the early 60s, 50 some odd rooms. Um, it had uh, 300 boat spaces. This was when the resort was on the lake, basically. And so it was a really popular place, allegedly. And Margaret hung out there when they were shooting Viva Las Vegas. And it was a popular place for celebrities, casino managers. They would get away out to, to the Echo Bay Resort. And so that was managed by this guy named Johnny Pappas. Now, Pappas went missing, as you noted. Vandermark, I think, went missing. I think, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, I think around May of 76. No, I, and I'm, even, I think later. The, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the raid on the on the Stardust count room was in May or June. Okay, okay. And then Vandermark disappeared on like August okay. 1st or 2nd, and Johnny Pappas disappeared on August 18th, August 19, 18th. 1976. Yeah, he was supposed to meet with a couple of guys who wanted to buy one of the boats that he used out at Echo Bay, which he managed for right. Blit. Shows up at the restaurant, apparently showed up, uh, on the strip, I think it was called and Joe. I think it was called JoJo's. JoJo's, yeah, yeah. And 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 then that's it. They find his car. It's Cir it's Circus Circus, by the way, still on the strip, still still in business, not mobbed up anymore, but it was a mobbed up. Resort. And that's where and that's where Tony Spilatro, when he got to Vegas, his first you know shop that he opened up was in Circus Circus. Give shop in Circus, yeah. Okay. Before he went over and opened the Gold Rush near there, the right. jewelry shop, which was his you know front for stolen property. Now, they find his car, Pappas, they find his car in, in, in the circus parking lot. Keys are still in there. So clearly, foul play was involved. That was about it. That was about all anybody heard about Pappas for a long time. Years later, Ned Day, a muckraking reporter in Las Vegas, who had had some experience himself with the underworld in Milwaukee before moving to Las Vegas in his early 30s and became a, a crusading, mob-busting reporter in Las Vegas. Ned Day revealed that Pappas, right before he, he disappeared, as you note, August 18th, 1976, cars found in the circus parking lot. He apparently wanted to meet with Glick. The last person who saw him alive said Pappas wanted to meet with Alan Glick. Glick was too busy. He was nervous. Pappas was. He wanted to meet with Glick. He was an aide to Glick, really. But 
Glick didn't have time to meet. He was uh, to meet with Pappas. He was going from meeting to meeting at the hotel and all this other stuff. So Pappas ultimately went away. So there's some suspicion about, you know, why was Pappas so easy to, or, or eager to meet with Glick? What was going on with these two guys who said they wanted to buy the boat that Pappas used? And that's where it sort of it sort of went away, Scott, for a while until the body shows up in the lake. And that revived the whole discussion last year. Yeah. That revived the whole discussion about, okay, was it Vandermark? Was it Pappas? Guy, it was a guy, a male in the barrel with a uh, with uh, the the bullet holes, it, it, I mean, with the bullet shots, wearing Kmart clothes. Uh, is that, you know, is that, that doesn't fit, close? Right, that doesn't fit necessarily for a high roller right. Right, mob guy. That's which Pappas point. was. Yeah. And, you know, so somebody thought maybe this was just a low-level street bookie who wasn't paying. Maybe that's who they took out. So a lot of mystery still exists, but you're right, and your sources are always outstanding. And I mean, fingers, it seems to be pointing toward Papa, Scott. Yeah, I, I, the Kmart clothes. I mean, that, that's a, that, I, I that's don't a know big wrench in the my, in my me, If my memory serves, again, I, 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 I probably should have double-checked this before I jumped on the air. I thought the Kmart thing was the shoes. Uh, it may have been the shoes. Oh, shoes, clothes, something. I'm, I'm not Kmart. saying that that a mobster would, sure. would buy Kmart shoes, but it either. wasn't head to toe. But I don't saying. think it was like head to toe dressed in yeah. J.C. Penney or Kmart. Yeah. Right, right. It wasn't Florsheim shoes. It wasn't. Right. Yeah, but they yeah. were. But they were able to, I think, identify some of the or to predict or or hypothesize the the time period. It would make by sense. that the fact. I think I'm pretty sure that the line of shoe that he was wearing stopped being produced in 1981 or 1982. Yeah. So they knew yeah. that it happened before that. And maybe if he was uh, boating or whatever, it could have been like his work shoes. I don't know. Um, right, right. Yeah. So let's just uh, real quick talk about who Johnny Pappas was. His real name was Johnny Pagino Tacos. His alias was Johnny Pappas. Came from Chicago um, and was in the Chicago mobs or was affiliated with the Chicago mobs, you know, Greek branch, um, a guy named Gus Alex, Slim Alex, uh, was a as powerful as you can get in the Chicago mob without being uh, a made guy, without being an administrator. He was the fixer. He was the the grease the palm of the politicians and the police guy. He he ran what's known as the loop in Chicago. And if you're, if you've ever been to Chicago or you lived in Chicago like myself, you know, the loop uh, downtown Chicago is kind of split in two uh, oh, b between the river. Uh, when you cross the bridge, you're into the loop and that's where our, most of the business district is. But then when you go North uh, on the bridge and you go into the, the, the miracle mile and rush street, that's where all the, you know, dining and entertainment and, um, shopping is, but if you go to the loop, that's where all the, the office buildings are. And, uh, that's where the state of Illinois building is. It's where the federal court is. And that was where Gus Alex would, uh, you know, that that's where his, his presence was most felt. How far does he go back? He, he went go back, back to Capone or not that he far? went back, I think right around Capone. He had taken the place of, uh, Murray, the camel Humphreys, who was Another Capone's and JC, uh, sorry, Jacob, Greasy Thumb, Guzik, who had yeah. been Capone's payoff guys. Yeah. Um, and, and Gussie Alex kind of took over that job from them and uh, was 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 wielding power all the way through the 1980s. He got busted in, I think, 89 or 90, got locked up and died and died in prison. Um, but Pappas was sent to Las Vegas, I believe, in 1967 by Gus Alex. And there was about a seven year period there before he ended up at the Echo Bay. He was named CEO or, or whatever the actual title was, but the guy that was running Echo Bay, he got that job in 74. But for about seven, eight years before that, he was bouncing around uh, to different casinos. I think he worked at the Stardust for a while, uh, but he was also, and this is the, I want to throw it to, Larry and get his take on this. He was also heavily involved in politics and a and it was a some type of chairman of a of a branch of the Democratic Party there. So yeah. he he was he was more he wasn't just 
uh, a knuckle dragging gangster that was working for Tony Spilotti. I mean, this guy was uh, a little bit more of a Renaissance man in, in terms of what he was doing in, in Las Vegas. Yeah, he was smart. As you say, he, he did some time, I think, as a greeter at the castle. He's now with, with a Mirage, he's soon to be the Hard Rock. Um, I think at Caesars, Scott, he, he did. He was he was a greeter at some point. So, yeah, he was involved clearly before he was was a part of Glick's. Uh, and I think he group. went to the he went to the Stardust before, the he got, Stardust. before the Echo Bay. He was working in the Stardust under yeah. Lefty. Yeah. And became Glick's guy. So before all that, you're absolutely right. He. In the early days, Michael Callahan, and I worked for, for Michael Callahan at the Las Vegas Sun. He was the executive editor at the Sun when I was when I was at the Sun. Uh, Mike, Mike was a legend in Nevada. Mike was a populist governor. Going back to the Korean War, Mike was a, you know, a hero. He, he lost part of his leg in battle, um, kept fighting after losing part of his leg, came home, went to the University of Idaho, got an education, moved down to Nevada. Uh, mentored, by the way, he was a teacher, a school teacher, mentored Harry Reid, as you guys know, became an extremely powerful U.S. senator from Nevada, dead now. And, and you know, the airport in Las Vegas has been renamed for, for Harry Reid. So that's a part of Mike's background. Then he became a public official. He ran for lieutenant governor. That's where, uh, Scott, that's where Pappas got involved. He was uh, heavily involved in the uh, Democratic Party in Clark County, which as you guys know, Las Vegas is in Clark County. Pappas was involved with the Democratic Party, got in got in tight with all that crowd, became involved in uh, Michael Callahan's campaign for lieutenant governor. Then when Michael Callahan became governor, was sort of a driver for Michael Callahan and helped O'Callahan. So yeah, he was, he was completely politically tied in. And Michael Callahan, by the way, in no way, was 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 a you know mob mobbed up governor or in fact he was the he put Harry Reid on the Nevada Gaming Commission and Harry Reid went after Frank Rosenthal and people like that so Michael Callahan was clean squeaky clean he wasn't any implication which no one's made that I know of but any implication just to clear it up for for for, for the viewers here that O'Callahan's working with Pappas Pappas working with O'Callaghan had anything to do with the mob not true I mean you know O'Callaghan was was completely straight completely clean but anyway that does demonstrate how Pappas yeah as you say he wasn't just some mob guy coming in and and uh, blowing up cars and shooting people he he was involved politically in the early days and then and then moved into the uh, heavy involvement in casinos I mean I think it's pertinent to to put the Pappas disappearance and the Vandermark disappearance together because they both happened in the same couple of weeks in 76 and Vandermark fits that same, I mean, not to say that Vandermark, Vandermark was involved in politics. He wasn't, but Vandermark and Pappas were not your traditional tough guy gangsters. They were movers and shakers. They were, you know, you know, spokes on the wheel that were a little bit more polished, a little yeah. bit more refined, and help the wheel turn. So you need guys like that, right? You, you need you, guys like that, right. so the muscle guys can do what they do to, <laughs> right. to keep everyone in line. But right. the the straw that stirs the drink are are guys like that. Yeah, and I think along those same lines, they might not be able to give the government information on who was killed and where a body was buried. But they definitely can give the government information on where the money is going yeah. and how the money is, is flowing vertically, uh, shell companies, where money's being hidden. Um, and in both the cases of Vandermark and Pappas, there were worries, there were rumors that in the fallout from that first raid that – they were either talking already or were going to talk. And then I, I want to throw one thing at uh, Larry or throw another thing at Larry here. Vandermark. Um, Pappas is not a character in the movie Casino, but Vandermark is uh, the, 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 I don't know if it was John Nance or Jack Nance, who is the guy that, who is always going to the, to the Italian mob bosses in the back of that, grocery store and he's trying to explain you know uh he, he 
we've we've joked about this before about the you know you're saying the guys that we're paying to steal are stealing from us yeah and then <laughs> Nan says it's called leakage yeah yeah and then the guy says leakage my balls I want my money <laughs> yeah that John Nan's character was based on Jay Vandermark and in the movie they tell you that that Nance is killed because they were were that the the outfit was worried that Nance was going to flip because Nance's son was a oh, was a right. junkie right. yeah yeah well that's that was true with Vandermark Vandermark's son Jeffrey was a outfit associate drug addict that the outfit was worried about and he ended up dead uh within a year of his his dad disappearing so, and then, in, and then in the movie, it's the scene where they shoot the guy in the swimming pool. Right. That's supposed to be who Jay Vandermark was. He was in charge of the count rooms. Do they think he was skimming too? Do the outfits? Suspect? I think that they, because that might get you killed faster yeah. than snitching. I, I think, think there was a lot of, I think you're stealing from questions him. about that. And um, just whether or not someone like Jay Vandermark or even someone like Pappas can, could stand up to, to, to a big squeeze. And I think Pappas had a, had a bit of a record and had done a little bit of time, but not the kind of time that, that those cases ended up giving out, which was you were going to do 20 or you were going to do 10 to 20 years. Um, so Larry, did, did you know anything about the, the Vandermark family and you, you hit it perfectly and you made me think of now, by the way, you know, the threats that, that were happening, and, and, and you hit on it, Scott. Pappas's wife later said that there was an episode where someone tried to run Pappas off tried the road. Run. Yeah, like two weeks, two weeks before he disappeared. Yeah. Which would have yeah. been around the time Vandermark disappeared. Right, right. Someone uh, drove Pappas off the road when he was coming from Echo Bay back or back home. To Las Vegas. Well, and, and that demonstrates what that period was like with Vandermark, with Pappas. It, it, it's, it's really hard. And you know this, and you guys know this, to frame now for people who are familiar with the current Las Vegas, yeah. the way it was back then. And you and you and you hit on it with people who were respected. Then it turned out to be that they had some underworld connections. You had the Mo Daleses. You had you had uh, uh, Carl Thomas was seen as one of the most respected people in Las Vegas. Worked at the Stardust. Worked at the Trop Tropicana, and later was convicted of skimming. So a lot of these people who were seen as uh, stand-up community people uh, got later got in trouble. And, and it were Alan Glick, and now he didn't. He later, you know, he died uh, not too long ago. But but Glick, uh, we found out later on that Glick was an informant. Glick, right? yeah, it was, was an informant. Frank, lefty Lefty Rose was an involved. informant. Right. Frank Rose. Listen, our friend Jeff Schumacher at the Mob Museum, as you know. Uh, reported not long ago that that there was a lot of suspicion of Pappas was 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 it a former and yeah Frank Rosenthal never did get indicted never did get convicted or even arrested of anything car blew up in Las Vegas moved out of town but Jane Ann Morrison reporter the Review Journal a good friend of mine later reported that Rosenthal was an informant as was his wife Jerry played by De Niro and Sharon Stone yeah. in, in the movie so yeah I mean people were were seen as community. And they were members of the, of the Las Vegas Country Club. They with were Mo, dining with, with the power Mo elite in Las with Vegas. Mo with Mo, with Mo da Dining with the power elite in Las Vegas. And so that's the kind of town it was back then. There were a lot of cover-ups, a lot of people, a lot of winking, a lot of, if you, around that same time frame, I know I'm jumping around, but I'm just try, I've been trying to illustrate what that period was like in Las Vegas. Not involving Pappas, not involving that, that whole incident. But keep in mind, Al Bramlett, who ran the Culinary Union, as you guys know, in that same time frame, a little bit later, later was shot to death and buried out in the desert with his hands sticking up as if he were waving hmm. goodbye to the world by a hitman named Tom Hanley. So it was a very violent, very small world um, that that a lot of cover up, a lot of shenanigans. And if, if people stepped out of line, they were taken care of. Thus Vandermark, thus Pappas, potentially. I, That's I think what for, happened to those guys. For people that might not have the point of reference, I mean, even me and Jimmy, I mean, I, I don't have any memories of Vegas the way it used to be. The first time I went to Vegas was in the late 90s, early 2000s. By that point, it was corporatized to the 
to the level that it is now. And it's a, it's a corporate town now, right. but you know, in, from the time it was conceived in, in the forties through the eighties, it, it, it wasn't what it is now. It, right. it wasn't as, um, there was a lot of glitz and glamor, but it was, it was a different kind of glitz and glamor. It was all, I shouldn't say all of it. A lot of it was based on gambling. It was more gritty. I mean, right. I remember going there as a kid in the eighties and, um, I mean, I, obviously, I didn't appreciate the kinds of things we're talking about, but it was different. It was first of all, it wasn't as filled out. Yeah, and it was it was it was grittier, sleazier. But I don't really think. I mean this this sounds <laughs> this sounds like an yes. oxy this sounds like an oxymoron, but I don't think it is. Right now, you don't go to Vegas to gamble. I mean, you do some, but, yeah, but a lot of people don't. You're right. They Vegas go for is shows a destination and, to go and have fun and party right. and go to shows and yeah, go go shop. It's not. It used to be a place exactly. you went and gambled. Yes, you went and saw shows. The Rat Pack was there. People, Elvis, they performed there. But it's not the same way now. Where I, even me, who's a big gambler, the last handful of times that I've gone to Vegas, I haven't hit the tables hard. Well, yeah. for one thing, the table limits are out of control. Yeah, you, you guys hit it perfectly. Back in the day, there was a little bit of a sleazy element, which is why you, the major sports leagues wouldn't place teams there. Paul yeah. Tagliabue, the NFL commissioner, said, we'll never put an NFL team in Las Vegas. It was, you know, you had nudes on The NBA just stuff. came out like this week saying it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when yes. we're going to be in Vegas. Yeah. So, you know, you had nudes on ice. Circus, circus. Circus, circus. Still there. Upstairs where the arcade games are, ski ball and all that, throw the, you know, uh, shoot the, shoot the water balloon in the clown's mouth. There was a, there was a, a, uh, a, 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 a device where you could drop money in a slot. The slot would go down. There would be new dancers in. This was in Circus Circus. It was a sleazy town. People were attracted there to gamble, as, as you guys say. That was the moneymaker. Now, fast forward to now. Wall Street Journal had a story. Not too long ago, in 19, since 1999, this shows you how it's changed. Since 1999, the casinos on the Strip have made more money from entertainment, food, hotel, and all that than gambling, minus the, the COVID, the height of the COVID years. But it's totally transitioned. Bill Hornbuckle, who's the CEO of uh, MGM Resorts, said the other day on CNBC, the future of Las Vegas, where the revenue is going to come from now in the future is entertainment. Like you guys say, people go to see Adele. They go to see Usher. They go to shop at Versace. And they Dior go to party. And they just want to party. Get drunk. Get high. Go get The swimming laid. pool culture. Yeah, the swimming yeah. pool culture right. is massive now. That, that You want to know the big... I, I'm That's gonna, Las I'm Vegas gonna, now. I'm going to digress for a second. But you want to know the biggest racket that I have ever seen <laughs> in the world of hotels. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I'm in Vegas, and I'm sure it's, it's like this everywhere in Vegas now, I'm sure. But I think this was one of the first places to do it. And I was at the Cosmopolitan when it first yep. opened And that. Yep. At that point, it was, it was before COVID. It was the, the kind of the hottest new hotel. And they called the pool a day club <laughs> that you had to pay like $500 to go to the pool at your hotel. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what am I paying for? <laughs> oh, well, they're going to be playing music. I said, well, I can bring my, my AirPods. <laughs> Why am I paying to go to the pool? Right. I've never had to pay really, to go to the pool before. Yeah. That's not really a digression, really, because it really does underscore what this city is about. Now, think back to the old pictures you see on Las Vegas, the Desert Inn, the El Rancho, Vet, all those places. They'd have a little swimming pool. There'd be two or three people. Everybody was inside gambling. They have You drive down the strip. Don Rick was performing over here. Sinatra over there. Phyllis Diller over here. It was about getting gamblers to town. You had the entertainment. You had topless dancing. You had this, that, and these shows. So it was about getting the gamblers to town and keeping them in the casino. You didn't want them at the pool. Right. Right. You wanted yeah. them, you wanted them at the at the tables. Now Great that's point. changed, guys. Now they now they come for you wouldn't have imagined a Versace shop in Las Vegas back in the 60s and 70s. But now part of it is Las Vegas is, I know we're, we're out, we'll get back on topic, but it does reflect the change in, in the city from the Pappas, the barrel in the lake days to now. Las Vegas now is a convention city. That's mm -hmm. what drives Elon Musk is building an underground. It's all about the conventions now. And back then, I remember doing stories at the Las Vegas Sun. I would ask people, governors and people who were at conventions, 
about whether they gambled and they were almost embarrassed to be in Las Vegas if they're, you know, out of state governors. <laughs> yeah. Because it was seen, you're right, as a kind of a tawdry place. Conventions wouldn't go to Las Vegas. You couldn't get an Apple or or you know Ford Motor Company or somebody like that to have a convention in Las Vegas because it was seen as tawdry. Bill Hornbuckle, the, the the CEO at MGM the other day, and we'll get back on topic, but no, it's okay. I like he it. said, he said. Las Vegas isn't Sin City anymore. It's the sports and entertainment capital of the world. And that's the difference between the lake, the barrel of the lake days and today. And you know what started in the 90s, and, it's, and I think it's still part of this new Vegas, and it was kind of, I think, kind of a bridge gap, was turning into a family friendly where yeah. you could bring your kids. Nobody was bringing their kids to <laughs> Vegas in the 60s. No, it was, when I was in a kid in the, seven, in the 80s going there, because I we were in California, it was it was pretty lame from a eight nine ten year old. Because right. other than Circus Circus, Circus Circus had Circus the Circus was one hotel right. that yeah. was kind of geared towards right. If you wanted to have a kid, but otherwise it was pretty boring for me. I was the one person at the pool because <laughs> as a kid there wasn't, and the casinos they wouldn't even let you in if you right. weren't uh, twenty one or whatever. So there was really wasn't anything to hang out. Now it's totally family friendly. It's like. It wasn't like it's that. It's Disneyland. I mean, yeah. that's what it is. An amusement park. As Nicholas Pelleggi said, who wrote, who wrote right. Casino. In 1989, Steve Wynn, who, who you know, casino developer who had, who had the Golden Nugget downtown. Who got his start with Detroit mob guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At the frontier. In back east. And I think his dad was. Oh, yeah. In, well, but his well, first well, job in law, I, I spent the, hit the, hit the, um, Simon Benny. Uh, when I spent the last couple of months of Tony Zerilli's life with him, who owned the frontier. Yeah, he said you and we never ended up releasing the book. It will never see the light of day. But while we were writing a book that never got published, he was like, you be sure to put in there that Steve Wynn would have been nothing without me. I gave him his first job. God, you got to write that book. Man. Yeah. You gotta get that published. So so Wynn goes out to we mentioned that that Pappas worked at the Castaways goes out to that location, builds the Mirage. That was the first mega resort themed resort and then like scott says that kicked off this whole family friendly new york new york with the fair with the uh, uh roller, roller coaster, coaster. The, the the treasure island with the pirates battling out front now meanwhile Derek stevens who as scott knows has some detroit history himself he opened circa resort downtown first casino to come from the ground up in downtown las vegas in 40 years adults kids aren't allowed it's an adults only property. There's a steakhouse in the in the in the basement in the bottom called Berries. You know, kids can go there. Otherwise, kids can't. And part of what Derek Stevens said when he opened Circa, and, and I, I don't know if you guys have been, I, it's fantastic. Yeah, I stayed, I stayed there last year. Fantastic. He said he wanted Las Vegas to be like old Las Vegas. And so a part of what Scott is talking about is, you know, transition to that kid-friendly place. And now maybe there's a trend to get it back. It's all about conventions. The Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority ran an ad even saying, television ads even saying, basically trick your kids into staying at home so you can go to Las Vegas. So it's well, funny to see how Las Vegas has has, has swung back and forth. And there's the definitely we, we no call, mob influence anymore. We, <laughs> I mean, it's I like I grew up calling downtown old Vegas and um like I know, like some of my rock and roll hipster friends from California. See, Scott's a snob. He doesn't like downtown Vegas. No, he mean, wants to be on the strip. <laughs> but, the, 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 but my rock and roll hipster friends from California that they prefer they prefer downtown it's a because different vibe. because it's a different to his vibe. point, right? It's more it's more rock and roll. It's more gritty. It's more like the old yeah. <laughs> a little bit a little bit uh, sleazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, my my girl, well, my fiance, girlfriend, and daughter they like downtown better than the strip. Yeah, I hear that from from younger people. Well, they have stage shows, music shows, and yeah, the elder, the they like Fremont Street. Downtown. They like the free. They like Fremont Street. <laughs> I bust this ball. No, it's true. <laughs> no, 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 no. It is. It is. It, it, look, the Fremont to this day. And we mentioned a second ago, the Fremont is still in business in downtown. That's one of the Argent Corp. Allen Glick casinos. It took me 10 years. It took me 15 years of going to Vegas before I even saw downtown. Yeah. I never went downtown until. I, I remember it as a kid, the Golden Nugget. I just, I, and the Cowboy. Yeah. The, yeah. The, I remember yeah. Yeah. Was, Vic, Vic, was it Vic? Yeah. Vic uh, Vegas Vic. Yeah. Vegas Vic. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I think this is good. We set the scene of what Vegas was, what Vegas is. Yeah, it's fun. So, just, you know, for people to understand, there is no mob influence now, really. I mean, if there is, it's incredibly 
small and barely, I, I, I don't even want to give that notion a lifeline. There's nothing there. There might be guys that have affiliations that are in Vegas doing things, but there's there's no mob influence. In no, I, I think there's still guys that have juice loans and maybe selling yeah. coke or something, but not they don't they don't influence right. the politics but, and industry. But the like entire town was basically controlled yeah. by organized crime from the 40s to the 80s, and Chicago specifically had represent uh, representatives that would. Uh, be fronting their interests on the West Coast. Johnny Rosselli, as you mentioned before, a handsome Johnny Rosselli was kind of the first one. Capone sent him out there. And then uh, a guy named Marshall Cofano, who they called uh, Johnny Shoes, he went out there in a, <laughs> I don't know, this is probably an oxymoron too, or just, Marshall Cofano was, I guess, demoted or taken out of Las Vegas by the Chicago bosses because he was being quote unquote too loud and replaced with Tony Spilatro in 1971. <laughs> and it's like, Oh, you thought that was loud. Yeah. You thought Marshall Cafano was being uh, a cowboy and, and being outlandish with his behavior and puffing his chest out too much. Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Spilatro hits the, uh, hits the scene in 71 Rosenthal had already been out there for a couple years and, uh, you know, he, he's a, a bull in a China shop. <laughs> he, he gets there. And I think within the first, uh, three years, there's more murders, uh, in that city than there had been combined the previous 30. And he, you know, again, I'm, I'm repeating stuff that if you've seen the movie, you know, I mean, there had been no real street level crime in Las Vegas until Spilatro got into town. And then he starts lining everybody up. And it he it bled out of the boardrooms onto the street. Bodies are dropping. People are getting physically assaulted. Yeah, uh, up until over. that point, the mob's main interest was the skim. Yeah, and it Tony's was. the one who's like, we well, could you know extort, yeah. sell dope, armed robbery. Well, and Tony, you were there to look street, after the skim, crime. but you weren't taking that much of the skim. The right. skim, the bulk of the skim, was going back to the Midwest right. and getting whacked up amongst all the Midwest bosses. Tony Spilatro's job, ostensibly, was just there to make sure it ran smoothly. But any piece of it he was taking was small, which yeah. is why he said, well, why can't I'm out here? It's wide open. Right. Why not come and, and take a piece, take a big piece of the street or take take the whole thing? Yeah. Well, as you guys know, he had the whole New Orleans game. Frank right. Lyle. So that, that's where, right. That's yeah, the good yeah. segue. So he he gets here in 71 and then he starts importing guys from Chicago to become his inner circle, his crew. They became known as the hole in the wall gang. These were all guys or 90% of these guys came from Spilatro's old stomping grounds, came from the grand Avenue crew, came from Cicero. Uh, and one of those guys is probably the Indian Shiro who we're going to get back to in a second, but go ahead, Larry. Yeah. And, and that's one way they take that. He took over the street rackets. They would literally knock a hole in the wall of buildings and homes and things like that come out with, with stolen goods. And, and that's why they were called the hole in the wall game. You, you know, yeah, he, he, he controlled the street rackets, the violence level picked up. Um, so th that's the scene that we go into in the mid seventies when all these years later, a barrel, a corroded bar barrel surfaces at the lake and everybody. And the funny thing about it is, the Mob Museum does a magnificent job of, of laying out what the city's history is. But a lot of new people, it really woke a lot of new people up and, and, and people who knew the history. But a lot of people are like, what? What's going on? What is this with the mob killing people, putting them in barrels and so it brought all that back. I did an interview for the Mob Museum uh, uh, this month with Chuck Gowdy uh, of uh, uh, television station. I think that's might be and where I'm. Yes, that was a great piece. That was that, that's kind of my jumping off point here. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, 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 no. Go ahead, jump. But Chuck with uh, the ABC uh, affiliate up in Chicago, great guys. You guys know he's been one of the top mob reporters in the country yeah. for years. And Chuck was talking about that. He even came out to Las Vegas when the body surfaced, and you know has great sources, and we're trying to sort it out. And I think kind of ended up where you are, Scott. So, you know, he's uh, everybody's looking into this. It kind of brought it all back to the forefront when this body surfaced, and that's what. Why, here we are a year later. Now, let me say, and I don't mean to cut off 
in hog all the time. But one of the things that you're I our guest that, hog as much as you no, want. No, no, no. I think one of the things that may be significant, and I think this this, this may turn the stone a little bit. Think think back to and you mentioned it, Scott. Some of the other bodies that have been found, boating accidents, drownings, that kind of DNA revealed. Now, according to 2020 story on ABC several weeks ago, um, one of the things that may re- a niece of a niece of Pappas's, who's been convinced that it's Pappas, is still involved in this. So, according to the story. They're really close, investigators are, to revealing something about this case, presumably from the DNA um, on this person who was in the barrel. Can I ask you guys about the, and maybe you're not qualified, but you guys are crime reporters, maybe you have some insight. I mean, what kind of forensic evidence are you guys hopeful that can be uh, taken from a body that's been in a barrel underneath the lake? (laughs) for 40 something uh, yeah. years. I mean, you just mentioned DNA. I mean, are you guys, uh, I mean, I know you're not forensic scientists, but I would, I would, would guess that-, that the, the goal or the, the ultimate end point where, where these uh, authorities want to get to, if they're going to charge anybody. And I was surprised to see that comment made by, I, I don't know who exactly made it, but saying something along the lines of, Anybody that was involved in this is like shuddering right now with the knowledge that we're about to find out who it is and we're going to come get you. It's kind of along the lines of what this what this uh, member of law enforcement said. Um, I, I think the their end game is to try to find the DNA that they can match on um, Pappas and find other DNA, I guess, whether it be in the in the barrel, on the barrel, yeah, on the on the clothes that they found, and then match it if they were going to try to go arrest Paul the Indian Shiro. And I want to be very clear: I don't know that Paul the, Paul the Indian Shiro is somebody that the the law enforcement has on. Uh, I don't know for sure. My sources are telling me yes, but I, I don't have this. Uh, I'm not saying. Let me be clear. I'm not saying that if they identify Johnny Pappas, they're immediately going to go arrest Pauly Shiro. But I've been told that if there are going to be charges, look for Pauly Shiro to be involved in those charges. That they're, that they're hearing or they have heard from informants, maybe going back to the 1970s, that Paul the Indian Shiro was involved in, I believe, both the Pappas and the Vandermark disappearances. Um so if you can match DNA from somewhere in that crime scene to zero, and you get you yeah. Shiro, you get a um, a court a court order to get uh, Shiro, uh, you know, swab his tongue. Or I was even saying just testimonials. If you get if you're saying that there there may be people that are still around, if they can get them to snitch or confess yeah. or something, yeah, then then you wouldn't even need the their DNA necessarily. Just just the identify. I think the you. Body. Do, I, 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 Yes, I agree, but I think that they would do everything in their power to get some D- some DNA match that's not if they if they identify it as Pappas, try to get in within that barrel, find another oh, sure. DNA um, imprint sample, yeah. sample and then tie case. it to whoever it is. And Shiro's name is the one that has popped up to me. I don't think there aren't a lot of those uh, hole in the wall game guys that are still alive. Frank Collada's passed a couple years ago. Um Wayne Matecki apparently is out there somewhere. Larry yeah. Newman's gone. Larry, Sorry to cut you off, Scott. No, it's okay. Yeah. These these are guys that uh would have been involved in murders. I so Polly Shearer was like 85 years old, or, you know, he's in his 80s. Um these are these are guys that are at the end of their lives. It it is yeah it's a it's a group of people that that are are aging and, and aren't many of them left. Now as you know, Oscar Goodman, former mayor of Las Vegas, mob lawyer, uh, you, you know, he insists that every time somebody turns up in the trunk of a car or yeah. in a barrel or in a, in a hole in the desert or whatever, everybody says it's Tony Spilatro. But yeah, I mean, he it, likes to downplay it. Yeah, it's, exactly, it's in his, it's exactly. it's in his, it's in well, his interest. Yeah. He represented Spilatro. Yeah. In fact, there is a statue. The mayor's steakhouse downtown at the plaza. There's a statue to with, with the mayor with, mm-hmm. with, with him. So 
you, you've got both sides out there. But I think, yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think it, what, what it may. And there are things we don't know. We don't know where the slugs still in the barrel. Right. We don't know. I, mean, I guess dental record. We just don't know what they have. The only thing that's become public, unless Scott's seen something that I haven't, or, or, or the clothing yeah. uh, uh, things, a watch apparently. But who knows what else w- was 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 in there that we just don't know about. Another slight digression. I'm interested in both your opinions on this. Why don't you think Oscar Goodman, after all these years, I'm not saying you, you got to get up and and um, v- vilify your, your former friend and, and client, but why can't you just acknowledge that, like, yeah, the guy killed a lot of people. Like, and I guess I, I find it strange that Oscar Goodman after all these years still wants to kind of push back on the notion that Tony Spilatro was a wild man going through Vegas, killing people. I mean, is that really something that you can dispute? I know that he never got convicted of a murder. If he would have, but that's because he was killed himself. Right. I said, if he, if he would have stayed alive, (laughs) I think he eventually probably would have been right. But I, I, I just scratch my head when I see Oscar still doing this revisionist history. And all due respect to Oscar, who I have a ton of respect for. People ask us to have him on as a guest, but I yeah. don't know him. I've never talked to him. I have enormous respect for Oscar Goodman too. Great attorney, and you know, he, as, as as he's always said, if if people mention more than twenty people, Spilatro may have killed more than then why haven't they been able to pin it on him? Is was was sort of I'm paraphrasing, but right. So he's a really he's an outstanding attorney. Outstanding attorney. But and, my and, point, my point and is, he would assert that the feds. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off, Scott, but he okay. would assert again. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he would assert that prosecutors and investigators and people like that overreach their 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 power, extended beyond what their lawful power is. So, you know, who knows I, how it ended up as Palatro had lived? But you just have you're 40 years removed now, 35 plus years removed from it. I just don't know why you can't be a little more honest if you're had, if you're Goodman. We had Fish on; he did the same thing. I know you're right. Yeah, and it more is wrong. Right. Well, I I think he has said again. I may be wrong whether he said. I think he said that he never Spotter never told him he killed anybody. Right. I mean, yeah, of he's he was a saint. the guy was a saint. What are you talking about? He's he defending him based on what he knows. You know, right. so who knows? We, and, he, and, and and he was Rosenthal's attorney and. Uh, Jimmy Chagra. A big, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, I found it in my reporting and I, I guess it, it's apples and oranges, but I can build relationships with some of these guys and I can like these guys, but I can also sit around on an interview and I would have no problem saying a guy that I like and a guy that I've gotten close to is a sociopath and is a killer. I, I just don't know why you can't separate it. And it's just reflective of the way Las Vegas is. You, you look at people, Rosenthal, Frank Rosenthal had a television show. <laughs> Spilatro, as, as Scott noted, was active in Las Vegas from 71 deep into the 80s. These people were in town for a long time. They were known criminals. And the power structure in Las Vegas didn't do anything about it. Judges, prosecutors, law enforcement people, some tried, some did, but it's it's almost inconceivable that yeah. that a guy like Frank Rosenthal could have a television show. Sinatra was on it, you know, a lot of big shots were on it, and everyone knew who he was. And so, and to your point, as I'm doing the math in my head, it was about ten years into into Spilatro's run that the cases started to pile up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a long time. It, I mean, if it, if it was five years, I don't know, but it was 10 years. And then between like 81, 82. And when he got killed in 86, he had like three or four cases, if not more that he, that he was facing. And eventually he was going to get, um, he was going to get nailed in one of those, but it, it took a while to your point. I mean, it didn't look like the Vegas authorities were, were either they couldn't or uh, there were other, re- but nothing was really being done. For right. that first decade, well, we had uh, not to digress too much, but we had an episode on Detroit drug kingpins, and we had a prominent attorney who defended a lot of them. and And he's he's a nice guy, but it, it was an awkward episode because he's like, I don't even know what we're here to talk about because these were good guys, and I I don't I don't know what you guys are talking about. They've never, they've never been involved in any <laughs> right. murders, right. the drug stuff. I don't I don't know where you guys are getting that from, so I'm not sure what we're here to talk well, I about. Felt like he was litigating it. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I'm like, Steve, these guys have all been dead for 30, 40 years. Right. Like, yeah. But it was a similar 
opposed yeah. to what you're talking about. Like I, I don't, he was a good guy as far as I'm concerned. So I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you have to respect good defense attorneys. And one yeah. of the things Oscar Goodman has always said, if, 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 if people in the, uh, in that community, the judicial, law enforcement community, prosecutorial com- community, if they can abuse their power to try to put somebody like, you, you know, accused criminal like Spilatro, then what would they do with any of us? That that was always his point. They they that they, they can abuse their power on somebody that 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 society thinks is vile, but they can also do it on on us. That that was always his sort of take on on uh you know the whole role of the defense attorney you know i think uh jumping back into summer of 76 what i think is one of the most noteworthy and we're going to wrap up here in the next 10 10 15 minutes uh when i what i think is the most noteworthy thing i guess in the in those investigations that that led to the skimming being exposed and, and the mob bosses all going to jail was so you, you you have the first skim case which was related to Detroit so we know a lot about it uh, at the frontier and uh, the guys from Detroit and St Louis get caught skimming six million dollars but the feds didn't really know how and then these the cases that came in the early eighties they to the mid eighties they figured out how they were doing it and it it all kind of traces back to a wire, and this is also referenced in in Casino, traces back to a wire that was in a restaurant in Kansas City where they were trying to get information on a murder that had nothing to do with the Vegas skim, and they overheard conversations on how the skim was being perpetrated. And that's in, I think, in the spring of 76, which leads to the raid of the count room, which leads to the disappearance of, of Vandermark and Pappas. That's exactly right. What happened was the Villa Capri, no longer there, right. in Kansas City on Independence Avenue, I think is where it, where, where it was, a wire under a table. As you say, there was a mob war in Kansas City. That's what the feds were trying to get some information on. And some names begin to pop up, nicknames. Rosenthal is referred to as crazy and genius. Was an, so there were nicknames being used. And so they put together that they were talking about the skim in Las Vegas. And then... At a, at a residence in North, in North Kansas City, across the river, uh, at a home that belonged to a relative of Nick Savella, the Kansas City crime boss in those days. At a relative's home, Carl Thomas, who I mentioned earlier, longtime casino executive, considered a, a sterling member of the community until then. And Joe Agosto, who ran the, the, a show at the, at the Tropicana, they show up at this residence in Kansas City and they say, the feds had bugged it. They're cooking meals. Somebody's cooking something and they're chatting. And then Augusto and Thomas, two Las Vegas casino executives, begin to explain to the Savella crime family how the skim works in Las Vegas. That's referenced in the movie Casino. There's a little bug at the top of that Italian restaurant. It wasn't it's the best episode. scene in the movie. I yeah. Think. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Because mom, mom yeah, is yeah. like yelling at the mom. Because uh, because what, what's his name? Keep swearing. <laughs> Vinny, uh, the, the character was supposed to be Artie Piscano. The actor was Vinny Vela. Drops F bombs. So yeah. that, yeah, that blew I said freaking head. I said freaking head. <laughs> <laughs> that blew the whole thing open and, and, and led to everybody getting suspicious about who the snitches are and this, that, and the other. Rosenthal goes to a gaming commission meeting, blows up on Harry Reid. It just got so volatile that, and so that, high profile. That conversation that you just met, mentioned that was on a wiretap was like, it must be, I mean, the holy grail. If you're if you're the FBI and you're trying to figure out how this, I guess it's not incredibly inc- intricate, but an incredibly top secret um, way to, to steal money from casinos. And you've been trying to, cracked that egg for 10, 15 years at that point. And you literally get a hold of a conversation between the two guys that are, if not in charge of it at the very high level of people that are in charge of it. And the mob boss of the the one or one or two mob bosses of Kansas city are saying to these guys, explain to us how you do this. (laughs) And they're just going, they're going by, (laughs) they're going piece by piece, uh, you know, bullet point by bullet point. And it's all being recorded. Carl Thomas and Joe Augusto. Yeah. And that's why I say, and maybe I'm overblowing it. I know there are a lot of significant mob sites around the country, 
I still say that it's called the, the Marlowe, the, 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 the person who owned the house last name was Marlowe, a relative of the Savellas. I still say the Marlowe house in Kansas City, which is still there, by the way. The Marlowe house, to me, is one of the most significant mob locations in the country. Yep. I don't know. who it's, it's a private residence. I don't know who lives there. But uh, because of what Scott said, that's where that recording where two Las Vegas executives unfolded how the skin works <laughs> on, on tape. They didn't know it was being taped, obviously. Right. Uh, and then Savannah's audio. We've had a shameless self-promotion. We've had Gary Jenkins on. Right. We talked about this the, with Gary. The video uh, channel. And uh, there's another audio episode with Gary Jenkins. So if you like this topic, you can revisit that in our archives. And then another piece of evidence that, that was just a killer, and, and a, it was referenced in Casino, Tuffy DeLuna, who was the underboss or a high-ranking guy in Kansas City, he was, I think Nick Savilla's brother was the underboss, and then Tuffy was kind of like a conciliary, but they didn't really have a conciliary, and then eventually Tuffy became underboss. That's neither here nor there. But when they raided Tuffy's house, they found ledgers. <laughs> and, you know, he's he's keeping track of how the money is being yeah. stolen and, who, and who's getting it. Uh, so that leads to these two disappearances. Fast forward 40 years, bodies are popping up. I, only time will tell what happens. I, I, I want to ask a question yeah. about, before we wrap up about yeah. environmental science here. Um, actually something good for that region was they had an unusual amount of rain, uh, and also, uh, snow up in the mountains, which is helping Lake Mead. My understanding is that long-term, the projections are, are still that it, it's, it's it's going to it's going to dry up, but at least in the in the short term, th those are some positive signs. Uh, do you think that has any implications on these investigations? Are 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 some of these bodies going to stay maybe hidden longer than you thought, Scott? Your thoughts? I mean, to to me, it remains to be seen. I mean, you know, it it um, it's a lot easier to dump a barrel in the lake than it is to dig a hole in the desert. But you know. Who, who knows? A lot have already surfaced. And, and, and when they dumped them 50 years ago, 40 or 50 years ago, they couldn't have imagined that one day the yeah, barrel yeah. would be where they dumped it because the lake received. And, and by the way, Echo Bay Resort closed uh, some time ago because the water receded. So, and what, as I said earlier, there were 300 boat dock slips at one point, but the water receded so far that it really wasn't, you know, feasible to get to the walk to, to, to the boat docks from the resort. So, you know, are more bodies going to surface? Scott, your thoughts? I mean, I, who knows what's going to happen? Okay. So I think there are about six to eight people that disappeared on Tony Spilatro's watch guys that we've, and men and women, by the way, that uh, allegedly that um, are unaccounted for. I believe I'm not saying we're going to ID all six, seven, eight of them, but I, I believe that over the next year, two, three years, we will identify more than one. I think we'll, we'll get maybe two, three uh, murders solved and, and be able to clear those um, off the, the Tony Spilatro uh, murder resume. Uh, I just, you mean they'll ID the body and will and then like conjecture that it was tied? Or are you saying actual like Well, there are there are I've detailed it quite a bit on, on gangsterreport.com. Um I'm pretty sure I've detailed at least six, maybe seven, of people that were in the orbit of the Spilatro crew that disappeared between nineteen seventy six and nineteen eighty six. But, but I mean, are you saying you think the FBI will officially Yes, Say, ID it as this Spilatro's body, and crew we believe the Spilatro yeah, okay. crew did it. Not necessarily wow. arrest people, right? Right? No, of course. Yeah, that. Yeah, right. That's obviously more challenging, but but they will say case closed. I believe that there'll be more than one. I'm not saying there'll be a half dozen, sure. but that's interesting. Uh, that makes sense. Plus, there were other hitmen there. The Hammonds. We mentioned the right. Hammonds a moment ago. So there were more killers in town. Only time will tell. If I'm Paul Shiro, I'd be worried about this just because. Um, of some some previous precedent about dragging guys that are got one foot in the grave to account for old school murders. Um, I, I mentioned, I think on our last episode or, or a couple episodes ago, Frank 
Cadillac Frank Salemi, uh, the, the the Godfather of New England, was sitting in witness protection, living a living his best life out in Atlanta. He was eighty five years old around that. The body gets dug up in Providence, and he's pulled out of witness protection, put on trial, convicted of murder. Um, so Pauly Shiro did twenty years. Uh, he first went away, I think, in ninety nine ish. Uh, on a on a big burglary ring, high end burglary ring that he was a part of, that was going all around the Midwest, stealing stealing millions of dollars worth of jewelry, and then he was convicted in in the famous Family Secrets case, which brought to light the murders of the Spilatro brothers and a lot of stuff that was going on in Las Vegas. Um, I covered that trial and others. Shameless self promotion. Go get the book Family Affair uh, that I wrote uh, about that uh, situation. Great book. And Shiro was convicted in that of killing little Malvachi, who Mm. was another member of the Spilatro crew who was out in in Phoenix underneath Shiro uh, running travel junkets back and forth between Chicago and and Las Vegas. He was a a maitre d' at a restaurant there, and they believed that Malvachi was was cooperating or was going to cooperate. Shiro killed or was part of the hit team that killed Vachi. The Spilatros were killed like the week after that in June of 86. But I just, if I'm Paul Shearer, I'm I'm thinking that there's a better than good chance that if they do ID this body as Johnny Pappas, that, uh, that Paul Shearer will eventually be, if not charged, he'll be implicated. And I think we're getting close. I think we're getting close. So Larry, thank you so much. Anything you want to plug? No, I, but, but let me just say, to mention that, and I forgot to mention it, it's, it is not shameless self-promotion to promote Gary Jenkins. The, the show you guys did with him was fantastic. Thank and you. I meant to say, when talking about the Bill of Capri and the Marlowe House in Kansas City, Gary, as you guys know, Gary's got on his Gangland Wire website, Gary's got actual audio, that surveillance audio yep. that he that he obtained years ago of the people in the Bill of Capri talking about uh, skimming in Las Vegas and in the Marlow House. So I meant to mention that. I'm glad you mentioned Gary because he's got some fantastic stuff. Yeah. Was, Larry, this was great. We, we, we it, it, I'm embarrassed that it took us three years to get Larry on this pod. <laughs> Larry, you're going to, you're going to be a recurring guest. I'm calling it right now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, please. We would love to have you back uh, in the near future and we could chop up so much of your career. So much of, uh, we were talking off, off camera uh, about uh, Jeff Gerdman. Yeah, uh, yeah, who the the great oh. great reporter in, in Las Vegas who was tragically murdered by a subject of his investigation who was running for political office felt like Jeff was going to expose him and he killed him. This we just got, happened. In the we got to talk years. about that because yeah. the trial may be coming up in November unless it gets pushed back. Yeah, I mean Jeff Jeff covered the mob. Jeff yep. was the one that got hit by a mobster in the mouth, a mob yep. associate at the Sands. So yeah, I mean don't get me started on Jeff because we'll be here for a long time more, but we definitely need, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about Jeff. And Thank you, Jeff. Larry. You are, you are the OG OG when it comes to <laughs> crime reporting in Las Vegas. That's why we went to him. We go right to the source, him and John Smith, Jeff Schumacher and a yeah, uh, couple great guys. others. They, they do such a great job uh, covering that territory over the years. So thank you, Larry, for, for Jimmy, for, for Ben behind the glass. We went a little long this time, uh, but we love it. We'll see you next week. Uh, Scott Bernstein, OG Podcast, out.